This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 314, Dev to Owner. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about transitioning from a developer to an owner with Nathan Denzel. Nathan is the partner and technology director at Mythic Digital. He's been programming PHP since 2004 and working with Drupal since 2015. He currently lives in Rhode Island and is a Drupal grandmaster. When he's not doing the code thing, he likes to uh, manage his turf, which we, we may talk about later. Nate, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Uh, I am John Picozzi, and today joining me as usual, Nick Laughlin. Nick, what's going on with you? Good morning. Uh, not too much with me this week. Just wanted to give a, a quick update on the last couple of weeks. I was talking about some composer stuff and Drupal 9 updates, and I had a composer issue this week and was on the infrastructure channel chatting with Mixologic and just wanted to give a heads up to people. Uh, he's working on a, a project right now uh, called Lenient. Uh, it's not out yet, but it should be this week, I think he said, and that su is supposed to help people that are having some of those Drupal 8 to 9 upgrade issues with Composer, because uh, as you know, Composer checks, Composer will check dependencies before it applies patches. So you can't use a patch to make something Drupal 9 compatible. Uh, and so it sounds like this module or Composer package or whatever it's going to be will help with that and, and maybe make that upgrade process a little bit easier. So keep an eye out. Cool. Joining us for the third time, uh, Tara King. How are you? I'm doing well. I baked some more bread this week. That's all I do oh, now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, my update is that I recently discovered something called Music League um, and have been playing it with my colleagues and with my friends. And I might just start like a neighborhood league. It's like themed music competition. So you put a theme in, everybody submits a song. And then once the song has all been submitted, you get to vote on which song is the best song. I'm not actually good at this game, but it's been really fun. So are you creating the song or are you like trying to recreate no. a popular song? That would be next level. No, you just put a Spotify link in <laughs> to another song. Huh. So say road trip songs, everybody will go find their favorite road trip song, put it into the, to the app and then voting will happen and you get popularity points. Hmm. So that's been really fun. So, so now I'm thinking of uh, Sweet Home Alabama. For some reason. You're Rachel. welcome, slash I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Nate, uh, what is going on with you? You have a uh in the the agenda the agenda here it says landscaping project. So we are gonna probably talk about your about your turf, right? Yeah, this is uh a, a turf podcast now since I'm here. Uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and by turf, <laughs> I am by turf, folks, we mean lawn. Nate has a wonderful, uh wonderful lawn. Yeah, I troll John Bacosi the entire summer so far, taking pictures after I've mowed my lawn. And yeah, I got into landscaping and turf management last April. Uh, coincidentally, uh, when everything locked down here in Rhode Island, uh, tried to figure out what I could do on my property to keep myself busy. So I bought a tractor and I decided to refinish my 30,000 square foot lawn. Still in progress, because I was like, hey, I could do that in like three months now. So, you know, so it's going to be October, 2021, a year and a half into it, almost done installing a walkway currently <laughs> in the front yard. So that's what, what I do. You, what do you use them for the walkway pavers? Uh, I am using pavers. So I'm just using concrete red and charcoal pavers. Uh, I'm installing nice. it this week. Been working on the base currently. I'm very paranoid about. That's important. Very paranoid about obviously living in New England and living in a very, a very, I don't like the word moist, but a very wet state where it rains a lot and then it freezes and I want to make sure I have a good base. I have about like a 12 foot pack base, not 12 foot, 12 inch uh, pack base uh, that I'm working on, but uh, I'm too cheap to rent a plate compactor. So I'm doing it by hand and I'm getting don't, buff in the process. Don't do it by hand. It, too late. It will it's almost not work. Done. Don't, almost don't do it by hand. You will regret that. I mean, I, I did my uh, patio maybe two years ago and... I went down 18 inches, put 12 inches of gravel, uh, uh, 12 inches of gravel and maybe an inch and a half of sand or whatever it was. 
and hand compacted it. And while it, it's standing up, there's still a couple of places where you can see it dipped a tiny bit. Um, yeah. I mean, water's not pooling or anything, but I regret not renting. Listen, and finding that sounds it almost perfect compact. to me. I, I think you'll, I think you'll be okay. I'm yeah, not I'm striving for it. perfection here. I currently have had weeds and dirt and sand in my front yard. So this will be much better than, than the, the bar there, is very low here. The upside there is, you know, how it's built so you can take it apart and redo it if you need to. That's fair. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, you may be able to hear, or you may not be able to hear, uh, we're having a thunderstorm right now. So hopefully, hopefully that doesn't interrupt us, but, uh, big news for talking Drupal, um, John, myself, I'm talking about myself in the third person now, um, myself, Nick and Steven have been asked to keynote Drupal GovCon this year. So, um, we will be, uh, doing, doing that, which is going to be fun. Um, and let me, actually pull this link up so I know when when that is. So we are going to be actually talking about using um, uh, your passion and skills to power open source. We're going to be talking about non-code contributions. So that is going to be really fun. I am excited about it. And uh, Me too. Yeah, you can find more about that on DrupalGovCon.org. And uh, this year's dates are October 13th through the 15th. So you can also attend and, and hear it uh, virtually live or live virtually, depending on how you want to put those words together. Moving right along, let's talk about the module of the week. This one I have never, ever, ever used. I have no idea what it does, but Nick is going to tell us about Username enumeration prevention. Yeah, so what is username enumeration? So username enumeration is a way to find out what people's usernames are on a website when you're not authenticated. So I initially discovered this when a client of mine had a security audit and they came back and said, hey, we can figure out who all the usernames on your website and that's a security risk. And the security team for that uh, client said, hey, we need to close this security hole. Uh, so I started out with reporting a security issue uh, through the Drupal security uh, website. And they came back and said, this is a known issue. It's not considered a security issue since usernames are not considered protected information. Uh, but there is a module that helps with that called username enumeration prevention. And that module does exactly what it sounds like. It kind of um, prevents people from determining what usernames are uh, when they're not authenticated. So it's a... Pretty, pretty simple module. I'm going to ask a dumb question. How do you figure out somebody's username when you're not authenticated? Uh, so if you go, for example, to some, I think URLs like, well, it's not considered a security issue by Drupal.org, uh, by the Drupal security team. So I think it's safe to say how you do this. And there's a module that fixes it. And I also think that keeping things secret isn't a way to security. So if this is an issue that concerns you, you should use the module. But I believe the URL is something like if you go to like user slash one slash one, for example, it will say something like this is the user's name, username, user slash two slash one will tell you user huh. two's username. So uh, a bot could potentially just scroll through all those names, find out they can find out what the primary username is and then try to, you know, log in. So now they know what the username is. So they're not guessing usernames as well. Um, so again, this module close that security hole, um, whether you agree or not, whether it's a security hole, I installed it and it cleared that flag for that client. So a uh, nice and easy module. And the maintainer of the module is named Nick Santa, which I think is pretty awesome. <laughs> huh. I will say new, new every day. Oh, sorry, John. Uh, oh. Nick, I, I will say if you ever use the module, I think it's called 403 to 404 and it converts all your 403s uh, to 404 status messages. It, it it essentially does the same thing where it prevents a data leak for oh. even unpublished content. So if someone goes node slash one, node slash three, and they just keep iterating until they find, you know, get a 403, they're like, oh, it's actually unpublished content. Interesting. You can convert them to 404s. Uh, I've had a couple of clients in the past request that because I also think that's a weird, it's a weird right. response, but the reason why they're 403 is it's because it's the access. No, no, uh, I, I understand yeah. why, but why that happens. Why do they want to up? Why do they want to remove that? Like, what's the? They because if they, for instance, this client in particular, if they had a blog post that they pulled down, and it, it the link was still out there in the inter interwebs, they because you could 
you could essentially gain some some like metadata from the URL, right? So like if you if you knew the URL by some way or guessed the URL by some way, like you could you could there there could be a title in the URL or if um, no, 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 no. no. So that wasn't the case. Knows. This was the, it's a lot simpler. Their SEO guy just wanted a 404 when content wasn't published. So okay, oh. makes sense. Well, I mean that yeah. makes sense. Like why? I, from their perspective, was why should the CMS return a a status code of 403 if the content isn't accessible publicly, which I agree with, but mm -hmm. it just, the 403 is just obviously coming in from the access API. Yeah. Um, right. So. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I'll have to check that module out. Huh. Which makes me wonder that like, that feels like that should be a core change, but anyway, we can move on. We don't have to dive into the inner workings of Drupal here. So in this talking Drupal. Well, it is, and okay. usually we go down rabbit holes, but uh, we like to we like to make sure they're topical rabbit rabbit holes. So, um, we're talking about the transition from uh, developer to owner today. Uh, Nate has has forged that path, and um, today we're going to just you know have a conversation with him about uh, uh, why he did it, and um, maybe maybe get some tips for somebody that out there that might be thinking of of doing the same thing. So, first and foremost. Nate, can you give us a real high level overview um, of your path, uh, you know, starting with, I know that you used to work, you know, for the state of Massachusetts, and then you kind of got into the development and, and that sort of thing. So can you, can you give us an idea of like high level overview of, of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, it even goes before that. So uh, when I was in high school, I had some uh, pretty bad health problems and I was out of school a lot and I was homeschooled my sophomore and first semester of junior year. So I ended up having surgery. And like I said, I, I was home a lot. So I got into playing video games and then ended up joining some like online communities for the video game and they needed a web developer. And I was like, I can do it. And I had no idea how to program. So I taught myself PHP and I started maintaining their website. And that's really where it all started in like 2004, I was, 13, 14 years old, um, like I said, like early years in high school. And then I really liked it, started freelancing and working in PHP BB. I don't know if you, anybody remembers yeah. the software is still kicking around, uh, yeah. made some core contributions uh, over the years. Um, I forget if I whipped this out uh, in previous podcasts, but I still have the PHP BB conquering Olympus bear from like 2006, I think. Uh, I ended up, it was like, you could buy it and donate to the project. Um, hmm. But yeah, I still keep it around. I think it's cool. Uh, so then, yeah, I started feeling better, started going back to high school, did things non-computer wise. And then I got into criminal justice, went to college for that, uh, started working for police departments as a dispatcher, started working for the state of Massachusetts after that. Um, and then while I was a dispatcher there, I ended up sliding into like a different role doing like radio programming, electrical work, uh, like very like interesting, like radio frequency work uh, with the state of Massachusetts. We were rolling out uh, the state's new then in 20, 2015, or sorry, 2012 uh, was their new like uh, trunked radio system. And then so, because I was doing that, I wasn't dispatching as much. There was a need to maintain the dispatch software, which was entirely custom and web-based and their web development vendor wasn't turning around fast enough. So they knew I had experience and I started dabbling back into uh, web development again in 2012 um, after taking a couple of years off and just doing it as a hobby. And then long story short, uh, maxed out my pay pretty quickly with the state. <laughs> and I was like, eh, I want to make more money. So started going into this full time, started working for a company called Oomph in Providence, Rhode Island, met John Picozzi, sat diagonal from him for about three years, and then kind of worked my way through the industry. And here I am today. Like, So before we move on to the next question, I need to know what game and is the website still around? <laughs> uh, it's a sad story, actually. So one, it's RuneScape, which is still around. I knew uh, it. I, knew it was RuneScape. <laughs> I was gonna guess that. <laughs> yeah, RuneScape. So I was playing that uh, when I was nine years old, and 
2000. Yeah, RuneScape. I don't even know what the like, classic. I don't know. Like, I don't know what it's called anymore. But yeah, when it was like a little uh, yeah. 600 by 400 Java applet window. Uh, love that game. Uh, yeah, and then I was a member of a website called Rune Village, um, which okay. there was a couple of big ones, but um, yeah, obviously this was before Facebook was around and forums were the thing. So moving on from RuneScape and, and all that. So I'm curious when, when you kind of made the transition from code to non-code back to kind of developing in, in code related, when did you decide that you wanted to become an owner or partner in a firm rather than just being, you know, developer or an architect? Yeah. Um, I think there's a couple moments. Uh, I think the first one was I was working for an agency and we just closed this really big deal uh, with the agency's largest client and seven figure deal. And I worked really hard to get the deal and then we delivered. And then uh, I realized I still made my salary and I was like, hey, if I was like an integral part of this, I just kind of want to do this on my own and end up you know, feeling a little more reward out of it instead of like a, a nice crisp high five uh, from, from the management team. I think a second portion of that was actually, I left the agency life and started working for a product team. And then I had some, you know, transparently some really bad, uh, leadership, uh, engineering leadership and, uh, the company I was with my immediate managers and my mid-level managers were fantastic. It was just like the leadership couldn't pick a direction and they reorged like three times. And I realized I was like, I'm just never going to be happy working for anybody else. So I had already been doing freelancing for several years on the side. And I just said, you know, I'm not really trying very hard freelancing wise and I'm still getting work. Why don't I just make the switch full time? I was going to ask you about your motivation, but I, I think we just heard sort of why you made the move. And I'm curious what you think about how a move like this would work for everyone, for other people. Um, is this the kind of move for everyone? Yeah, I mean, so no, this is not the move for everybody. This is probably the most stressful thing I've ever done in my life. Um, besides having professional wise, I mean, personal wise, having a child uh, has been a interesting challenge in itself uh, this past year, especially during COVID. Um, but professionally, this is this is honestly the most difficult thing I've I've um, I've done. I think trying to trying to balance what is growth. Right. I think growth is like growth is different and success is different to everybody. And I talk talk with a lot of other CEOs of companies um, who are larger than us, who are agencies. And to them, some of them growth is revenue. And so some of them growth is employee count and numbers and number of projects that can turn over. And to me, like I think growth and success, uh, for me personally is making sure that I have enough to pay my bills. I'm still enjoying what I'm doing and I'm working on projects that are really exciting. Uh, and I still find ways to make more revenue every year. Um, mm -hmm. But I have learned very quickly with trying to bring friends in as contractors or people that I know in as contractors, this is not the life for everybody. Like this is a grind. And I think that anybody you speak to who has started an agency or started their own company outside of being a freelancer, even a freelancer obviously deals with this, which is like, it is a grind to find the work. It is a grind to maintain the relationships. It is a grind to do the work. Uh, and your <laughs> work-life balance really suffers. And having only been doing this full time for now less than a year, I'm still trying to find what that balance is in my life to make sure that I stay successful and also I maintain, you know, a healthy uh, relationship with with my company. So, um, how big is Mythic Digital at the moment? And, and let's talk a little bit about the company itself. Like, is it just you and a couple of other employees? Do you have employees? Um, let's just set the level for for listeners. Well, yeah. Um, so right now it's myself and my business partner. We're 50, 50, uh, Nicole Frazier, uh, actually Nicole Adio now, she just got married this year. Um, and Nicole is a front end developer, designer, UX strategist. I'm a, 
backend uh, developer, DevOps, and like architecture uh, specialist. So we really complement our skill set. And what we're able to do is we're both uh, extroverted individuals. We're both really driven to try to work really as hard as we can to build this business. And on the flip side, we're able to interface with the clients, transform business requirements, the technical requirements, and then kind of uh, give them off to some of the contractors we work with. But I will say, uh, Steve Cross uh, and I have been talking about this for several years, and I've been telling him what my goals going into this have been. And, uh, you know, one thing Steve told me, uh, because he spent obviously several uh, decades running his own agency. And, you know, he said he found has found more success in, you know, running his business with just him and his business partner, rather than having 10, 20, 30 employees, right? Owning an agency is a very linear business model. The more employees I have, the more gross revenue I can make, right? But what is your net revenue out of that? It's very linear, right? I, I can I can still charge a certain rate, but as an agency owner, I'm now accepting risk that my salary or hourly or contractors are making sure they're hitting their uh, they're hitting their scope and they're making sure they're not going over. There's just a lot of risk involved when you bring in other people, and obviously you're not doing this yourselves. I'm just not in a position where I want to take the risk to hire a full-time employee. And that is just like the risk of just making sure they get the job done. That's not the risk of workman's comp, disability, insurance, paid time off. Yeah. Uh, there's been so much to this that has, uh, it, it's, it's really shocking. Uh, it's really shocking how difficult it actually is to bootstrap a small business in the United States. It, it really is, especially if you're not taking outside investment and then you're just using your own money and your own time to do this. Um, so let's, let's dig into that a little bit, right? Because, um, you know, you kind of gave us a, a history of where you came from. And I assume that you didn't just one day wake up and go, hey, I'm going to quit my job and start a company. Um, you know, you were probably working at this for a little bit before, you know, you were able to quit your job and, and work at this full time. But like, if a listener is thinking about making this move and like, they're like, yes, Nate, like I want, like Nate's my spirit animal. I want to, I want to be like Nate when I grow up. Um, you know, what should they, what should they consider? What should they think about? So I think the, I think the biggest thing about owning an agency or even just being a freelancer and selling yourself for work is, are the soft skills. I've worked with so many people who are just so smart, so talented programming wise, and they lack the soft skills. And it is such a hard stop to progress anywhere outside of being a software engineer. Mm -hmm. And I contribute my soft skills to working in government, having to be able to write situational reports and give updates in front of a room full of people and not just a room full of any people like high ranking state officials in the state of Massachusetts. It just kind of, you just had to do it. Right. And I remember one of my first client meetings at Oomph, uh, the CEO at Oomph pulled me aside and goes, how are you so comfortable speaking to like the senior director of, of this client? And I'm just like, I don't know. Like I gave a presentation from the Lieutenant governor of Massachusetts. Like this is, <laughs> this is very easy for me. Um, so I, I think the most important thing is soft skills. If you can't, uh, if you're not comfortable to communicate with a with a client and you're not comfortable to sell yourself and be not aggressive, but assertive uh, in your sales process, uh, you just will not succeed. And I think that just that goes for a one a two person company like like Mythic or, you know, a 30 person company like, uh, I don't know, any one of these other agencies out here. So, I mean, you know, soft skills are are. I think important in, in anything, in anything that you do, but I mean, is that a, is, that's not a, um, a deterring factor, right? Because if you were going into a partnership with somebody, that other person could have those soft skills. Um, and, and, you know, you guys could complement each other, uh, uh, pretty well. What do you think as far as, um, you know, like your expectations, 
should be, you know, when making this, this change. So for example, you know, I'm thinking, as, you know, somebody listening to this again, looking to make this change, maybe, maybe trying to get some insight into like what the mindset is like, Hey, I'm going to do this because I want to make more money. I want more work-life balance. I want more uh, freedom to work with people that I want. Like, what do you think, you know, what do you think the, the priorities are there for somebody that's thinking about this? Um, I don't know if that's really easy to answer. I would say, let's say what my priorities were. Um, yeah, it's different. It's different for every person, every company. But yeah. I, I am curious to your, your priorities there. I want to say my priorities, Nick, and I want to know yours because you've been doing this, uh, you know, with enlightened development for several years longer than obviously I have full time. But I will say my motivation, honestly, number one was money. I realized very quickly that as a being self-employed and and having my own clients, I'd make way more money than I would working for somebody else. Uh, I think number two is flexibility of schedule as a business owner and not actually having an employer. You know, I set expectations of my clients is I get the, I get the work done when I get the work done. If you need me at a meeting, I will be there. Right. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I get to make my own schedule and you know, this Thursday I'm going apple picking with my wife and my kid, you know, during the day. So I like that sense of freedom. I don't need to go to my manager and get approval for time off. Um, and I think lastly, the motivation is just knowing that there's more, right? There's more than just the nine to five. I know there's more than just mythic digital today. There's more success to have. So I I'm, I'm hungry for that. And I want to keep iterating on that success year over year and try to see where I can get. And maybe that's, you know, mythic digital is the size of Lullabot one day, or mythic digital is not an agency and it transitions to you know, a product company doing, doing something. But as of today, I'm very happy where, where we're at, uh, where Nicole and I are at and the contractors that work for us and it, it's working for us right now. But yeah, Nick, what about you? Yeah. So it, it, it kind of changes. I mean, a lot of my motivations are, um, somewhat similar. I mean, a, a lot of it for me is the ability to have variety both in day to day and year to year. So, you know, I have several different clients um, and those projects are all very different. Another portion of it is I do, well, you know, many times I'm working with agencies or companies that don't have, you know, creative input. I do have a lot of input on the architecture side. Um, so, I, and I can, I can self-select and make sure that it's projects that both I, I will be interested in, but also will be successful for the client. Um, but in the beginning, it kind of started similar. Like I, I graduated in 2008, 2008 was not a good year to get a job in the United States. And I kind of accidentally started a business doing websites. <laughs> uh, so, it, you know, but as it, as it goes on, it's really, you know, the freedom to choose the freedom to set your own schedule. Now I will say, um, as a freelancer, I think the the idea of like being your own boss is kind of a myth. I mean, I, I like to say I'm not my own boss. I have as many clients as I have, as, as many bosses as I have, um, because those relationships go both ways. Like I have the freedom to choose, pick and choose some projects, but um, clients occasionally move on or projects end. You know, you do have to answer to your clients at the end and make sure that you're providing value to them. And so while they they can't dictate to me like, Hey, this hour, this minute you're working and I can make decisions. Like you said, Nate, like if you want to take off an afternoon, those are decisions you can make, but, um, you're not, you're not your own boss in that. Like if you don't maintain those relationships, you don't get that work done. You're not going to get paid at the end of the day. Right. Um, so there's, there's a different level of accountability. Um, but I've, I've also realized that for me, that level of accountability is the kind of, and that level of uh, work ethic, that's, that's what I enjoy. Um, I think I would have a very hard time uh, working for an agency or working on just one project only because um, I like, I like having new problems to solve all, all the time. And uh, if you're working just on one product all the time, while there certainly is new innovation, 
I think it comes along a lot slower. Yeah. I mean, one of our, so, one of our clients okay. we've had for years now, um, while it's not an actual product, it feels like a product team because we just keep maintaining the same sites year over year. Um, but the interesting part is they like to rebuild <laughs> like every six months of something. <laughs> so there actually is always variety. Um, That's great. And having been on a product team as well uh, for, for two years prior to, to starting Mythic, I, I think it just depends on what, what product team that you're on. Um, but I will say, Nick, that when I worked for an agency, what you're describing of like maintaining relationships and being accountable to the, to the client, like I had to do that working for an agency as an employee. And I had to answer to my manager and my project manager. And I had way more bosses working for an agency than I do now. Like, even though I don't consider my clients a boss, like I said, I set the expectation with my clients that this is a partnership. Like we are at an equal level. We don't, no one's above each other. If they come to me with a request, I will come back with a recommendation if I don't think it's right, but I'm not going to tell them no. Um, Because at the end of the day, if they want to pay for it, they're going to get it. Um, Yeah. You know, but yeah, I, yeah, based on working for an agency, like it it is honestly, it feels like I report to less people, obviously. And my business partner is my best friend. um, And we've been friends for, I think, nearly six years now, five years. I don't know. Yeah. Um, we live in the next town from each other, (laughs) you know, like we're, we're very close and, uh, we work really well together. And I think, I think that's a really important part too, of like not feeling like you have a boss either. Yeah. I I, I think that's going, Nate's going apple picking with his bosses on Thursday. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I, I, I think that's a key thing that you just pointed out too, is that one of the reasons why I think it's a little bit different for me because I don't have the perspective of having worked for an agency when, once I started my company, I've just kind of stuck with it. But, you know, one of the things that I've seen in some companies I work with or agencies I work with, I have much more ability to pivot. Um, so for example, I, if there's a technology internally that I want to use, I just start using it. You know, I don't have to get approval. I don't have to get, you know, obviously if I'm deploying something or putting something in production, I need to run that by it. But if, if I want to switch from using Lando, for example, to DDEV, I just do that. Like th- there's no, there's no approval process beyond me. Like, is it going to provide me value? Um, is there something I can learn from it? Same thing on technology side. Like I wanted to start learning um, AWS a lot more because it's such a big part of the internet. And so I've pursued clients that uh, have AWS infrastructure. Um, so those types of decisions, you don't really, if you're an agency, many times you don't have control over that um, unless you're on, you know, management, the management side. But if you're on the management side, you're not building things generally. And I always want to be building things because I don't know, that's what kind of scratches that itch for me. So I'm curious, you, you mentioned you started this officially a little bit over around a year ago, right? Yep. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you've encountered so far? And, and I'm curious both on kind of the business side as well as the technology side. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you've encountered in the last year? Well, most of the challenges have been business side. So the biggest one has been, has been taxes. Uh, when I moved to Rhode Island from Massachusetts, uh, I moved in the middle of the year last year. And uh, it was really when M- Mythic was was really starting. It just happened organically. One of our clients came to me and, it's, and they were like, hey, uh, we're going to rebuild this, our big website. And can you find me two contractors and they'll, they'll contract for you? And I was just like, oh, wow. Okay. Like this is a business now. It was just me <laughs> just doing freelance work. So, and then we actually added another person. So we ended up having four people working on this project for like eight months. And that honestly really bootstrapped Mythic Digital. Um, so that's an important key here is don't force something. <laughs> don't force building a company if you're not ready, right? Like this happened organically and I felt like I felt like I was rushing it, but I in, in hindsight now looking a year back, I think it was the right time. It it really just happened. I had business, I ended up saving some revenue and and it was really just just bootstrapping that. Um 
another another challenge is honestly is saying no. <laughs> I remember working, uh, I remember working for Oomph, and it really being like a company motto. A motto for a while is like we were just saying yes to everything, and then like we were really just we had a lot of work. John, I don't know if you remember that time. It was like like three years ago. We just had so much work coming in, and <laughs> like we just couldn't like we just couldn't crush it fast enough. And I remember it was like a way of just being like like a yes, but. You know what I mean? Like, yes, but like, we'll, we'll do this. And I, that stuck with me of like, when to actually implement that. But I forgot. And I started saying yes to a lot of things. And I took a contract this year uh, as a subcontractor. And it was uh, a whole year contract. And at the same time I started that, I ended up injuring my hip. And I had to start like physical therapy. And the contract, when I first started it, was supposed to be for a development position. So I reduced my rate because it was for a long time, uh, a year plus, and in turn, that turned to a tech lead position. And then I felt like I couldn't even go to physical therapy uh, because I had like six hours of meetings a day as a contractor and I just like wasn't okay. So I had to, I had to literally sever the contract. Luckily, there was a clause in there that said I could in 10 days notice with written notice, sever the contract. But sometimes you just have to walk away from a situation. Like not every job is good for you or good for the other person. In this case, the red flag should have been, uh, I didn't have a technical interview. Uh, I didn't have like any vetting of my technical skills other than I was a, I'm a Drupal Grand Master and that's all I cared about. And likewise, I didn't ask the right questions about how the team operated and what the expectations were. Uh, because uh, obviously they, they they weren't set correctly. Uh, if I'm If the contract says, you know, Drupal module development, you don't sit in six hours of meeting talking about technical strategy. Um, so let me, let me yeah, ask you a follow-up question there. Um, as far as, you know, starting off a new, new business, uh, you know, you, you didn't say this cause you, the way that you started, um, you kind of had business already and you were, you were kind of moving in that direction. And, yeah. but, you know, starting a company, you know, a lot of people are um, um, scared that they won't be able to find business, right? And they won't be able to, they won't be able to have enough to, to keep them busy and pay, pay the bills, you know, and, and you just mentioned, you know, being, being okay with saying no, you know, which in my head equates to like setting expectations, but, you know, how do you, how do you, how did you fight the fear of, of being able to find business? Um, or how would you suggest that somebody that may not have like had business thrown upon them um, um, be able to fight that fear? The fear never goes away. Um, <laughs> three weeks ago. Uh, yeah. Three weeks ago was not a good time when I looked at our resourcing for Q4 and I saw that after we paid ourselves, we were in the negatives because, you know, we don't, it's a very volatile business. Business comes really quickly and it goes really quickly. Um, <laughs> when, you know, Nicole and I have our weekly business meetings where we discuss, you know, how we're doing, you know, what can we improve on? We basically have a weekly retrospective meeting because mm -hmm. um, her and I are not working on the same projects all the time. So we try to talk about what we're working on, what's not going well, and, and just how we can improve for the next week or the week after that. And yeah, I mean, three weeks ago, uh, I had a I had a real hard glimpse at what not having work could look like uh, because we've we've had several projects going on, um, and there a lot of them are all ending at the same time and didn't have work lined up. And we have some direct clients, we have some uh, agency partners where we sub out from agencies, and all of that work, like I said, just ends the end of October and. Uh, I kid you not, like a week after I had my, my freak out, because yes, transparently, I had a freak out. My, you know, Nicole is a very level-headed person, calmed me down, said, hey, you know, we've been doing this for a while. Like when we were both freelancers, like we always figure it out. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, you're wrong. You're wrong. And then, yeah, the next week we signed, you know, a couple more contracts and now we're good into, you know, I think the end of January now. So and it really didn't have to look that hard. We had three organic leads come in, uh, which was pretty yeah. incredible. And it's just weird how that, that works out. And it seems like now doing this uh, as mythic for a whole year, seems like certain points of the year, everybody's looking for help and it goes by the quarters. Yeah. So we got, yeah. we got really hammered with requests in June. And now we got really hammered with requests in September. 
Um, so it's really interesting how that works. Yeah, you, I mean the, that that fear I can attest never goes away. And the second, if you, as soon as the contract ends, whether it's because the project is over for some other reason, you always wonder if another one's coming after it. I mean that, in my mind, that never goes away. But you're right. You also have to kind of get used to the whole December January weirdness, like December in my experience at least like december and january everybody goes away and there's no work done but december is usually a very good month because everybody wants to pay their bills at the end of the year for tax purposes so and then january is the doldrums like you just because you barely do anything in december because everybody's away january like you just so you just have to be prepared for you know december is going to be a good month january and february are going to be really slow um revenue wise um, yeah yeah. I mean, the, you know, Nick, the other challenge too is, I mean, you're by yourself, right? It's, it's Nicole and I, so like we have to budget to make sure we're paying two people. Obviously two people yep. are doing the work and never mind also paying our contractors that work for us part-time yep. and then making sure we have money left over to pay our overhead, which is not much being a remote small company. Right. Uh, yep. But, and then making sure we put money away and then making sure that we have money left over after we pay the government uh, with taxes. And, um, you know, it's really, it's really a challenge. And like my head spins a lot because trying yeah. to figure out taxes are crazy. Like even yeah. owning an LLC, taxes are complicated. I would not, I don't know, a corporation, I, man. I just, okay. I just got to say, as far as having taxes and it, this is the end of this rabbit hole, I think. To, to, and I'll give you one piece of advice, Nate, if you're not already doing it. But I just have to say, it annoys me to no end that the quarters for taxes are April, June, September, January. Why is it April, June, September, January? Why isn't it just every three months, the quarters that <sighs> annoys me to no end? Um, yeah. and, and the piece of advice is this, make sure you start a SEP. If you, unless you already, unless you have a 401k that you guys are doing, which, which I know with uh, two people it sometimes makes sense, but if not, make sure you have a SEP because th that will give you a lot of flexibility come tax time. Uh, yeah. Can yeah. We, you, uh, can you elongate that acronym for our listeners? Uh, Self-employment plan, something like that. It's a Roth. So it's a way to invest. Yeah. Like uh, I, I don't work for plan. a company. Yeah. It's a retirement plan. Got it. Um, and you can, so a normal, this is a deep, deep rabbit hole, a normal Roth, you're only allowed to put something like $6,000 a year in a SEP because the business is on half of it. You have a sliding scale of how much you can put in and it just allows you to, um, it's off the top. So you're not paying taxes on whatever you put in there. Okay. Tara, get us out of this rabbit hole. All right. Let's, let's avoid the taxes. Um, wondering what kind of work mythic is sort of specializing in if there's a specialty, what kind of work you'd like to do more of? Yeah. Uh, so interestingly enough, I need to like start this. So uh, this past weekend, I got family pictures taken uh, with my wife and my son Harrison. And we, I was talking to the photographer afterwards after, you know, we're walking back to the car and I was like, Hey, like, are you busy right now? Like, are you busy at the beginning of the year with like prom and stuff and, and weddings in the summer? And she's like, I only do families and children and like, and like pregnancy photos. And she's like, when I started my business, I really wanted to focus on one thing or a couple things and be really, really good at it. And I was like, wow, I was like, it's really refreshing to meet somebody with that like mindset because like, that's what we do at Mythic. Like we're really focused on really helping agencies and companies build really good Drupal websites, like really good Drupal websites. Like we're focusing on quality here, not quantity. Uh, a lot of businesses focus on how can I like pump out as many websites as possible and hire as many people. Like I, I, I talked about success early early on with this and we measure success by like really the quality that we do and by the by word of mouth and you know we landed a really a really good contract this year by word of mouth because of our quality based on another work we did and you know we're doing two things and we're offering two separate services one is is like a support service where we can work with direct clients and maintain their website make sure they're they're upgraded our rates are much lower <laughs> than 
the other larger companies because we don't have a lot of overhead. Um, but I mean, it's enough. Our rate is high enough to pay our contractors and it's low enough to not break the bank uh, for those medium uh, to large size businesses that aren't enterprise. And I think there's still a space in Drupal where there's a lot of nonprofits that don't want to pay close to $200 an hour for somebody to upgrade their website month to month, yeah. month, right? So there is a really good um, market for us. And I think likewise is I can't charge freelancer rates because as an LLC, I've got to pay all these taxes and I have to pay self-employment insurance and I have to make sure that I'm making the money that I want to make monthly to make sure that it's still uh, lucrative for me to be self-employed. Uh, so it, it's it's a balance that I've been trying to figure out what, what our rate should be this year and I finally got there. Uh, another thing that we we focus on too is working with agencies. Uh, so we work with a handful of agencies throughout the year and we really just provide consulting services. So what we've really found is an agency reaches out and they go, hey, you know, we really want to improve on X. This year, it's really been Layout Builder focused and we've really done a lot with Layout Builder uh, over the years. And again, word of mouth, we got a couple of people reach out and they're like, hey, heard you work with Layout Builder. We're doing a Layout Builder project. What would you do to improve the user experience? And bam, we come in, we provide consultancy. Um, and again, we have a agency rate that's lower than our client rate, obviously, because, you know, they have their own margins uh, and we, you know, do consultancy uh, in that regard. And then also, if we have availability, we'll do other development work as well. We'll just staff hog straight development wise. But, um, you know, some of some of our best, you know, some of our best agency clients are really just coming in and providing like consultancy and there's no secret sauce to doing this, right? Like this is not rocket science. It's really just understanding how to do it the right way uh, or what I consider the right way. Um, because Drupal is not software, in my opinion, it's consultant where there's a lot of undocumented isms of Drupal. And from what I've seen is Drupal can be <laughs> completely different depending on who the consultant was and who actually built it. And you know, one of our clients we did a demo with a couple months ago uh, for Layout Builder, and they were like, whoa, this is better than Gutenberg in WordPress. I didn't think Drupal had this. And I was like, Drupal doesn't actually have this. This is Mythic's flavor of Layout Builder, right? And like, yeah. this is something that we're not particularly looking to open source, but this is a service that we offer our clients. If they want to spend the time and the money to have us build, we will build them a absolutely rocking layout builder content editor experience using a handful of different layout builder contributed modules and custom code that we have uh and we just go project to project with our with our work and you know we're getting really positive feedback and and yeah so that's really what we're focused in other than that devops just i see us i see us as like a really what is someone called us a mercenary shop a couple months ago some one of the agencies wow. that we worked with that Really come in, we kill it, and we leave. <laughs> there you go. That's interesting. So I gotta, I gotta ask since we're talking about kind of what you guys do, what you guys want to do more of. What's your, uh, what's your feeling on on Drupal seven? Like, are you, what, how are you advising your clients, um, and what should they do if they have a Drupal seven site? That's very interesting. So, I have not worked on a Drupal seven website in over three years, and I don't have any clients that are on Drupal seven. Coincidentally, I just had somebody reach out last week asking to help me my, uh, help them migrate from seven to nine. Uh, and the person I think was like a freelancer. I didn't really know much about it, but uh, they didn't want to work with us afterwards after they, they knew our rate, which again, I don't think is very high. But um, so I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. Um, that's, that's completely fair. Yeah. You kind of talked about this a little bit, but, but you know, I wonder you know, you, you've obviously been doing this for a year. You are, um, you know, you guys are, are, are busy and you're, you're planning, you know, you're running your, your weekly planning meetings. Like what's the, what's the long-term vision for mythic digital in your mind? We have a couple things cooking, uh, like a good chef. I'm not going to give you my recipe in that, that regard, but, uh, I think mythic digital as it is today, uh, we're really, we're doing really well. Uh, 
we're just we're doing well right now and what we're doing is is working and the partners that we have and the partners that we're acquiring again i like to use the word partner instead of clients or whatever like it is always a partnership especially when you're when you're building something i everybody has to be on the same page you can't there can't be any any animosity and the vision is continue what we're doing right now um and i think we need to make a decision you know as business owners nicole and i is when is the right time to hire employees and if if we even do that i think what i'm seeing industry wise is uh you know facebook amazon microsoft they're really driving up salaries for software engineers i mean when i worked uh when i worked for that organization on a product team one of the engineering managers left i think his salary he said was like 160 a uh, thousand a year as an engineering manager, and he went to Facebook making four hundred thousand dollars a year, working remote. Oh, wow! And that's a jump, a, a little one, yeah. So, I, I have these conversations with our agency partners again that we consult, and it's not just uh, it's not just technical consulting. We sometimes do business consulting, and one of our partners we did we, we do some business consulting with is just racking ideas off of each other of like right now is staffing. Right? How do you compete with these big orgs? I I, I look at uh, I look at people who've worked for Drupal agencies. One of the agencies we we were partnering with, their software engineering director left and went to AWS, and he tripled his salary. Like I can't even compete with that. Right? Mm -hmm. So, as an open source community, as agency owners, as developers, and it gives me pause of like what what is happening here. Right, like, what can we? How can we grow this industry and not get crushed uh, by these larger organizations, uh, especially staffing wise? And I think that it's a true testament of the people who work with Drupal that it's it's honestly not just about salary. It's not just about working for Silicon Valley or or I mean, it doesn't even matter because everyone can work remote now. Um, you know, it's it's really about doing what you love to do. And this, the, you know, the Drupal community is like really passionate about working working with this software. Um, and, but with all that being said, I don't really know how we grow right now just because of those challenges. I, you know, I, I've reached out several times to different contractors. And every time I reach out for a contractor when we have potential work coming in, their rates just keep going up, but our rate, our rate's not moving that fast. And what seems like what's happening here is the larger agencies who are billing at a higher rate may be more desperate for work than we are or for help. And they're willing to take that risk to pay higher. So when they see an agency like Mythic, you know, we're not a media current, right? I don't know, media current's much larger now than it was years ago, or we're not an FFW. And I can't throw that type of money out. Like I can't, I can't go negative hiring a contractor. So, so so do you think one thing that comes to mind there is like when somebody goes to work for, you know, <laughs> AWS or Facebook, right? One of the, one of the big four or five, however you want to split it up. Yeah. Um, like they're getting, you know, two times, three times their salary, but like the flexibility probably isn't there. Right. Like I imagine if, if, and when somebody comes to work for mythic, right. There's going to be like a, 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 pretty good amount of flexibility and schedule there, right? Where like you're making a, a decent salary, you're not making, you know, Facebook salary, but you're making a salary where, you know, it, it's reasonable for the work that you're doing and your your schedule is flexible. I imagine when you go to work for Facebook, you probably don't have that flexibility. Is that kind of what you're seeing out there in, in, the, in the real world or am I just totally making that up? Hmm. I mean, the product team that I worked on had a ton of autonomy and flexibility. And I feel like that's actually, again, I worked for one product company. Um, I feel like that feels like the norm based on the people I worked with that went to these larger companies, that it's very much the norm of, <laughs> there's a ton of autonomy. Everyone just, it, they're, they're trusted, they're paid well, um, but it's different, right? It's the product aspect that Nick was talking about. These larger companies are risk adverse. <laughs> To the products that they maintain so you're literally you know you're spending a week making a couple line code change backing it with automated tests and going through a qa process and then going through a rigorous code review process and 
those quick wins that you get to working for an agency or even being a contractor, you don't find those very often. Your wins are like weekly or monthly, um, depending on what type of deployment and release schedule that you have too in the organization you're working for. Um, yeah, so, the, the story I like to say is Oracle, like you make a one line code change to Oracle, the test suite takes 72 hours to run. <laughs> Yep. And you're you're guaranteed a one a one character change is going to cause thousands of tests to fail. So you're looking at you make it you make a one line code change, you wait seventy two hours, and then you have to find out why two thousand tests failed, and then fix those and, and iterate. And so you're right; it takes six months a year to get one one change in. So um, so if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, they're basically paying for for um you know mundane work because you're 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 basically making one line change and then you're waiting three weeks to get feedback and then you're waiting another three weeks before that well, gets retested yeah and like i mean you have to like, you have to remember oracle though isn't a software company oracle is well right i guess i'm talking that, about like, like they're, they're in a different product that <laughs> their company is about suing people and taking rights not well, about right I, I guess software, i'm talking so. about i'm talking about like facebook and like these bigger these bigger companies that are um <laughs> Man, we have gone down a rabbit hole here. But anyway, talking about those bigger companies that are developing software, like nobody wants to yeah. be the developer at Facebook that's put out a put out a buggy piece of code, right? And with with an agency, not that you want to put out buggy code, but you're a little um, you're a little less more confined, nimble. more nimble. That's a perfect way of putting it. Yeah, it's it's all a reward system and what people want out of it. There are some really, obviously, really talented people who work for product companies. Um, it's just, it's a different type of work. Uh, having done it, I won't do it again. But I also said when I worked for a product company, I wouldn't work for an agency again. Yet, and then I started one myself. So uh, I have whiplash myself trying to figure out what I what I want to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, Growth is really coupled for with a business with employees, right? Like I can't, I can't grow a company without employees. And I think the second part of that is like, <laughs> Nick mentioned it. I want to program still. I want to like be in the weeds. I want to, I want to do the work still. I'm not ready to, to take the step back and be a people manager yet. And right before I left the product company, um, I was my annual review. I was up for a promotion. I don't know what that would have been either a you know team lead or a people manager but i really wasn't interested in being a people manager there and that was also one of the reasons i realized i was like well i've maxed out where i was here as a senior software engineer and i don't really want to progress anymore working for somebody else um, also employees allow you to keep that level set for your for your cost right because you're not going out and dealing with those increasing costs for contractors like you have an employee you've reached an agreement like you're paying them reasonably. So, you know, I think that's another, another growth metric there um, that I'm sure you guys were looking at. I actually look at it the opposite, John, is I think employing people full-time currently is riskier than having uh, consistent contractors. And the reason why that is, is increasing healthcare costs year over year. Uh, honestly, policy changes both in state and federal government regarding empl employment and um, there's just too much risk for a business our size to take on uh, currently, unless we were to land a couple larger contracts that were spanning six plus months onward. Um, you know, the I'll like I'll name drop real quick. Chris Free, who's the CEO over at Chromatic, he, him and I have for the past year really conversed, and I've been going to him for for you know advice because. Chromatic kind of had a similar path to this. Uh, uh, Chris and Dave, uh, who are two uh, to the owners over at Chromatic, they really bootstrapped Chromatic like like Mythic was. They they had a couple larger projects come in. They had a couple full time contractors, not employer uh, employees, but contractors. And eventually, they organically got to a size where they were like, "Okay, we're going to convert you to employees. We're going to hire more people." They got out there, they started going to DrupalCon, they started going to different conferences to get more uh, employees. And I ended up working for Chromatic. And honestly, I was very inspired by their story and their business model to start Mythic. Um, so, and I, and I think that, again, it's organic. You don't just be like, hey, I'm going to hire a full-time employee tomorrow and, and take on 
all that risk unless you want to. I don't know. I'm risk averse. How uh, at this point are you growing your client base? You know, where do you find your clients? Um, so honestly, the biggest tool right now of finding clients are people finding me on the Acquia certification registry as a grandmaster, um, and then reaching out. So that's been that's been a really good sales and marketing tool. Uh, was getting my grandmaster certification. How, how um, hard was that? Can you can you tell listeners a little bit about that process? Uh, I, this is not a slight to Acquia certification, but I actually found it pretty easy. I'm not sure if that was me or the certification, um, but again, a lot of them were PHP focused. So I've been programming in PHP for so long. Uh, it is like I speak a second language at this point. Uh, I think some of the things that I really struggled on with the tests was around translation. Uh, I wasn't really, when I took the test at the time, I really wasn't, I hadn't done a multilingual site at all yet. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think it was like really, really translation based at the time. And I took the Drupal 8 certification in 20, 2017. Yeah. Okay. And I completed them all at DrupalCon Nashville, which is really interesting. I marathon them all. <laughs> they were half the price. So, <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. And th those were what, four separate certifications? Is that, is that accurate to combine together? It's three. So three. it's it's developer back end, front end, and then the fourth is not an actual certification, but it's a badge that says Grandmaster. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's cool. So Nate, this conversation has been really enlightening and super interesting. I'm wondering if there's anything else you'd like to mention or or you'd like to share with our listeners. Uh yeah, I mean, first off, thanks for having me. Um I've been uh it's exciting to uh, share my experience. I mean, I know being a listener of Talking Drupal, you've had you know Matt Westgate from Lullabot slash Tugboat come in and give his experiences and whatnot about the, like the success of Lullabot. You know, where I'm nowhere near that business experience wise, or or even you know Drupal experience wise. Matt's been in this industry for a long time, um, but I think it's a good fresh perspective that, you know, it kind of feels like to me, it's like the gig economy now. There's a lot of people I know who are going into being freelancers or going into starting their own business. And that's doing not even just programming, right? Like I know people who are like becoming construction workers and plumbers. And it's just, I think it's a really good opportunity is if you're interested in it, I think that like you should explore it, you know, not everybody's, I think, starts self-employment as a way of, of uh, I'm just going to quit my job and go, go and flip 180. You need to see if it's right for you. Um, you know, I did freelancing for about three years before I officially went to this full-time and it, I really liked it. And I liked it more than my full-time job. And then I realized that, you know, I could just be happier <laughs> if I was self-employed. So that's yeah. why I made the switch. So um, yeah, it's great because you can, <clears throat> being a freelancer, being self-employed isn't for everyone, but the nice thing is freelancing on the side can give you kind of a small taste of what it's like. I mean, it's, it's nothing's the same as actually just being self-employed, but you can kind of see if finding clients, managing those relationships, doing the work, um, handling contract issues, things like that. If you, you can kind of test that out beforehand and yeah, I, I would echo that. I would encourage people, if you're curious about it, try getting a couple of clients on the side uh, and, and see what it's like. And, and if you want to pursue it, um, I'd, I'd encourage you to. It's, it's interesting. Cause I, I am the exact opposite to uh, Nate and Nick um, because I very early on realized that I, didn't want to go have to like find my own food, uh, out there in the, in the digital world. I wanted to work for a company that was going out, finding projects. And I just wanted to, I wanted to solve problems and, um, you know, work with clients at that level, as opposed to, as opposed to having to go, go find that, um, find that work, which admittedly was kind of, was kind of reinforced by a, a brief career change to the, to the, um, 
account management side of things. It was fun to work with the clients, but like the finding of the business was, um, there's a lot of pressure there. And as Nick and Nate both said, you never get over that fear. So, um, and, and to be fair, the freelance stuff, like I think I did my last freelance project, like maybe five years ago. So, um, I've also kind of, uh, dropped that from, um, you know, I've dropped that from my repertoire as well, doing, doing much more personal, more, more personal projects at this point. But anyway. Well, Nate, thank you for joining us and giving us some background in Mythic Digital and the, uh, your perspective on going from dev to owner. Uh, so for our listeners, if you have questions or feedback, you can reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or via email at show at talkingdrupal.com. You can connect with your host, and other listeners on Drupal Slack and the Talking Drupal channel. And if you're interested in show news and updates, you can sign up for the newsletter at talkingdrupal.com slash newsletter. You can promote your Drupal camp on Talking Drupal. Learn more at talkingdrupal.com slash camp promo. And thank you patrons for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at talkingdrupal.com and choose become a patron. So Nate, if somebody wanted to um, learn more about Mythic Digital, reach out to you, hire Mythic Digital, how would they go about doing that? Uh, thanks for the promo, John. Uh, they would go to mythicdigital.io uh, or email me at nathan at mythicdigital.io. And uh, yeah, agency, business, you know, we're always willing to chat. Uh, love to help you out and uh, yeah, build amazing Drupal websites. Tara, what about you? Where can people find you? Sparkling robots everywhere. So Twitter, Drupal.org, anywhere it's sparkling robots or Tara.king at automatic.com. And automatic has two T's, A-U-T-O-M-A-T-T-I-C technically has three T's. Nick Laughlin, where can people find you? You can reach me pretty much everywhere at Nixman, N-I-C-X-V-A-N. I'm John Picozzi. You can find me on all the major social networks at John Picozzi as well as Drupal.org. And if you want to learn more about EPAM, you can go to epam.com. If you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. See you guys next week. Have a good one.